obsessed with the 1960s and I think for the most part you know it's a glorious fascinating liberating decade but like every good party there's always the bogeyman and um, here he is Charles Manson probably the world's most famous serial killer and mass murderer uh, the popular image of him is as demonic mad person who uh, killed many people in Los Angeles during the 1960s. And as a student of the 1960s, I kept bumping into this guy. And with an inquiring mind, a um, little bit of digging, found out that he wasn't a mass murder and serial killer. He actually never killed anyone. And it's questionable that the, you know, the, the, many of the things that happened weren't on his bidding. But because it's caught up in the 60s mythology, and uh, when the myth becomes legend, you print the legend. So, you know, I wanted to, totally tear this story apart and find out who was Charles Manson, what influence he actually had. And, you know, he's known as the person who pulled the curtain across the 60s. He's the party pooper. He, he ruined it all. It's interesting that the crimes that he and his family of associates were charged with actually occurred towards the end of 1969. So he really came in at the last minute. There's many people in America who actually were pretty upset with the whole hippie dream and the, the, the idolism and the freedom it spawned. So he was perfect. He, he, he came in at the right time for many people. But who was he? He was born in 1934, Kentucky, to a 15-year-old girl called Kathleen Maddox. Uh, she was a tearaway, she was a crazy kid, and she got pregnant. And uh, Charlie was a, a, a hindrance to her, so she, he was bounced around foster parents and relatives, and uh, she had little interest in him. Um, and as is the way of a lot of kids who have a pretty miserable start, he was on the bottom rung of a ladder, which uh, was really going nowhere. And uh, he gravitated from Borstal, Juvenile Hall, to whatever they call it, the States, into reform school. And he was, a career, he was working as well at the career ladder. And, um, towards the end of the 1950s with a dismal record. He uh, was jailed for 10 years uh, as an accumulation of charges, uh, which ended up with him trying to cash a $50 check, but he, he'd been let off so many times and more that this, he, he's now facing this accumulation of census. So he was in Long Island, California. And he had an epiphany of sorts. He started looking at himself and realizing what am I doing, and uh, what am I doing on this planet? And um, he started, rather as looking outwards for answers, he started looking inwards. And uh, there was various people in prison who helped him on a new path. Um, one person was Alvin Creepy Carpus, who was a Chicago criminal, who taught him how to play guitar. So he started writing songs. Uh, there was another chap called Lena Raymer, who was a Scientologist who uh, was quite high up in the organization before he was chair, and he started auditing. I don't know if you're familiar with auditing, but it's a, a process of clearing an individual's mind uh, for them to go forward. Whether it works or not, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a student of it. But anyway, the fact is that Charlie studied, reportedly, had 150 hours of auditing. Come 1967, March 1967, Charles Manson was released into a world which he'd left behind pretty much eight, nine years before. And after bumming around LA for a few days, he went up to San Francisco on the dawn of the Summer of Love, which is probably the greatest party for the 20th century, which was probably the most exciting period to be around. And I nurse personally, I regret I wasn't there. I've been ever since trying to recapture in my head being part of the Summer of Love. But anyway, Charles Manson made it to San Francisco. And he had a kudos because he, he was a jailbird. He had a... Um, a collateral. I think any of us have been young who meet someone a little older who's been to jail. Uh, you, you tend to warm towards them. So he, he, his title in uh, San Francisco, amongst many characters walking around San Francisco at that period, was the garden because he collected a lot of children. The children warmed towards him. They uh, rallied around him. And because he'd spent a lot of time looking at himself in prison with Scientology and uh, these other things that were going on in his head, 
people, he had a charisma. And this is another thing which is not so much publicized about Manson the Mania. He was a warmth and he could talk to young people in a way that no one else could. And for the runaways who'd gone to San Francisco, he made some sense. So he collected this gaggle of mainly female young admirers. And um, this became the family. Now, if you may know, if you know about Charles Manson, it was Charles Manson and the family, which is common. Uh, and it was, it was Charlie and a group of young girls. And they, like many people, indulged in San Francisco, all the different uh, cults and uh, mind-blowing events that were going on. The Process Church, um, all the other happenings and freakouts. They indulged in that. But Charlie himself was, was quite a wicked character. And again, contrary to popular belief, when San Francisco's Summer of Love was drawing to a close, harder drugs were coming in to that environment. Before it had been marijuana, LSD, and it was innocence. That's the other great thing, and I think people miss, is that LSD and hallucinatory substances at that point were giving people a new innocence. And when you look at the film and look at the pictures of, of, of Hate Ashbury at that time, it was beautiful innocence. People liberated and dancing. Towards the end of that uh, summer, with the word going out on the network of if you come to San Francisco, wear some flowers in your hair, a lot of people started coming to exploit that. Harder drugs were appearing. Um, notably, um, STP, which was a, uh, so it was a very strong variant of synthesized LSD, which produced three or four day trips, with psychosis running wild on the street. So, also what was coming in was speed, and Manson uh, was really against amphetamines. Again, you know, people seem to think he was gobbling anything he could get hold of, but no. And so he took off, like a lot of people were doing towards the tail end of 1967, in a school bus. And he put his family in the school bus, and they drove down to LA, to other places on the dark. At this point, Manson was aware, he's a very sort of receptive character, he was aware of the celebrity that could be attached to being a musician, and certainly in San Francisco and LA during the mid-1960s, there was many, many characters writing incredible stuff. And so Manson decided to write his own songs using lyrics which were revolutionary for the time, as I say. Um, and I brought an example of a couple of these songs which um, I'm going to play. This is a song called Ego, which Manson, again, you're looking at his head and what he was observing, not just under LSD, but also through his own observations. And um, I shall play a bit of it for you now. It's quite amazing. This, again, was two years before the Tate Raleigh Anchor Murders. This was in a period which none of that polluted him, or at least the atmosphere around him. Can hear it? Yeah. Yeah. Side. In the back. Front. No, it's in the back. Oh, it's in the front. No, it's in the back. They shove it in the back. They put it in the back. All the love in the back. Get in the back. All the love. Get in the back, boy. And they call it your subconscious.
Okay, I'll draw my little bit of music to a close. So, he was a musician in LA with a coterie of young girls who were in awe of him. This is good collateral uh, in approaching record companies, although they've heard nothing like this. Even in 1967, Manson was pushing the envelope in certain of these hit songs. Excuse me, what's that Manson singing? That was Charles Manson singing. That was in a recording studio in September 1967, which was a demo session from a Universal Record Do we know who played the fiddle? I beg your pardon? Do we know who played the fiddle? Well, what happened was that that actual session, a couple of years later, when the Tate Lau Bianca thing came up, there was an album called Lie that was released, yeah. and they all they put some sounds on top of it. So, so. the whole song sounds very much like the whole thing around us. Yes, okay. I mean, for, you know, for, for mid 1967, this is, this is quite something. Um, he charmed a lot of people in the music industry, and uh, through the contacts flying around, he met Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys, who um, was enchanted with Manson, but also enchanted with his women. And there was a promise of a recording contract. Manson at this time is still living in the bus, and through a series of strange incidents, he ends up finding a communal place for him and his family to live, a place called Spahn's Ranch, which was an old movie ranch in Chatsworth, California. And as is the way of the indeterminate existence they were living, they, these guys were living on a film set, they were dressing up in clothes, they were having a lovely time. Charlie was the head of this group, um, but at that point people were coming and going, there was no sort of control, I think they were very much in awe of what was going on, and enjoying what was going on. And um, one of the first journals of psychedelic research, in fact the only one at the time, which was offering some clarity to a... and I'm going to try and find it now. I've got it, I've got it. Here we are, the Journal of Psychedelic Drugs, which was published by the Haight-Ashbury <coughs> Free Medical Clinic, which, if those who've studied the landscape of this, um, was... It's still there. It's still there, is it? Yeah. Okay. So, this was offering free medical aid to people living in Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco area. It was also offering clarity on psychedelic usage, because there was none otherwise apart from what people just picked up. So it was, it was radical, revolutionary, as the lady said, it's still there. Well, such was Charles Manson's celebrity and his commune um, appearing to work. This journal commissioned a, um, a feature on, I'm going to try and find it now, a feature on the um, Manson's commune, which was published, funny enough, it was held back when all the brouhaha started. But um, it was a feature which was called The Structure of the Group Marriage Commune. And I'm going to read some bits of it now. Yeah, this is before the Tate La Bianca murder, before any of the mad publicity, so it's very clear. Most group marriage communes that survive for a long period of time have a father figure as the spiritual leader of the group. The group marriage commune under study had a father figure, Charles Manson. 33-year-old white male with a past history of involvement with the law. Although there were three people with some college education, including one person having a master's degree, members disapproved of the whole pro process of formal institutional education in America. They believed that education was a means of conditioning or brainwashing a young person with the values and mores of a dominant culture. Manson felt that a person should be open to change and willing to accept new values, but insisted that once someone had been indoctrinated by society, his value system became rigid. Approximately 20 members of this commune referred to themselves as the family, but we have chosen the group marriage commune because of the polygamous sexual relations, but affairs outside the family were rarely endorsed. In cases of sexual conflict, Manson made the final judgment as to what constituted the acceptable behaviour. Manson was 33 years old. He was an extroverted, persuasive individual who served as absolute ruler of the group marriage commune. What he sanctioned was approved by the rest of the group, but what he disapproved was forbidden. You'll like this. Tales of Manson's sexual prowess were related to all new members. One popular story often told that Manson would get up in the morning, make love, eat breakfast, make love, and then go back to sleep. He would wake later, make love, have lunch, make love, and go back to sleep. 
waking up late and he would make love, eat dinner, make love and go back to sleep, only to wake up in the middle of the night wanting to have intercourse again. So for whatever was going on, he was quite an incredible character. Um, but to give a clue here to things that possibly might have happened, um, and this is at the tail end of the feature, Charlie had a persuasive and mystical philosophy, placing great emphasis on the beliefs that people did not die and that infant consciousness was the ultimate state. However, Charlie's mysticism often became delusional, delusional, and he on occasions referred to himself as God, or God and the devil. Charlie could probably be described as an amity schizophrenic. So there were some warning signs there of what might possibly happen. Um, but as I say, um, this commune, like most communes, was elevated, everything was seeming to work. Manson's musical career was in an ascendancy, and the word coming from the music community of LA that he was possibly going to get a musical contract, a record contract, where these songs, such as the one I've just played here, and a dozen more, uh, he'd get a release. There were many people at that time, singer-songwriters with guitars, Tim Buckley, John Sebastian, uh, Albert, uh, the guy from Love, Albert Lee, um, who were writing sort of similar types of songs, so considered impossible. However, once Manson's songs, it, it, around the campfire with the girls singing, and lots of smoke of various sorts, you bounce that down to tape, it didn't really have the same effect. And equally, uh, Manson was becoming impatient because he wanted this record contract. Uh, one character who was instrumental in uh, pushing Manson, a guy called Terry Melcher, who was the son of Doris Day, uh, backed away from Manson. Um, at the same time, um, things were changing at the ranch. Uh, a lot of bikers were moving in. That, just like most, a lot of, if anyone's experienced a commune dwelling, you get incredible highs, you can get frightening lows, and I think it was going into a frightening low. LSD was used um, at the commune quite regularly. Uh, as I said, that um, <coughs> Manson forbid harder drugs, so amphetamine especially, and other sort of strong opiates were not equal and encouraged not allowed. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from my book here. Excuse me, it's just a light on me. Um, about an, e a, 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 an evening at the ranch with Charlie. Following Char Charlie would give a lecture in the evening, and it, it, was, it was full of a lot of, and this is interesting because a lot of what he said, his proclamations on the world that an apocalypse was an in, impending, and that there, there was also a, a, a possible race war which was going to overwhelm um, the world. And a lot of his members of the family would swallow all this. Uh, I mean, but again, as someone who came out of the New Age traveling movement in the 80s, I've sat around campfires and listened to a lot of rubbish, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's coming in all the time. Um, it made more sense to the prosecutors of Manson who used this whole helter-skelter theory, uh, which is a long, long story, but Manson adored the Beatles, and he felt that the Beatles were sending messages to him through their records, notably the White Album of 1968, <coughs> uh, two, two tracks especially, um, Blackbird and Helter Skelter, and also a track called Revolution 9, which anyone's heard, it's a mind blower. And he decoded messages in them that they were confirming a lot of what he was saying to his family. But this is, anyway, this is what would happen. Um, he would talk at the lecture, and then the group would repair back to one of the buildings on the main strip to smoke some weed and by candlelight sing along to some of Manson's songs. Once or twice a week, a bag of LSD made an appearance and would be ceremoniously shared out amongst those present. In the early days of the family, drug use was confined to marijuana and LSD. Occasionally a stash of peyote or mescaline would pass through the group. But that really was the sum total of the group's excursions into narcotics. Manson strictly forbade opiates and amphetamines of any kind, with good reason. He watched the speed freeze destroy the sun of love with a harder, more selfish vibe. And as a result, legions of communities were decimated as speed crazy psychotics destroyed the convivial conviviality of shared living. Manson knew this only too well, and again, he knew that the drugs and amphetamines coming it could easily break up or even destroy some of his mind games and some of his scenarios. Other, also, it, it, the psychedelics were the main key for unlocking the minds of its followers. During these communal acid sessions, Charlie remained studiously controlled, ensuring that all members of the group partook in the experience. But to sustain his position as chief guide and guru, Manson would either take half a tower of the drug or none at all. 
he was careful to be temperate. Given the potency, potency of LSD at that time, and one wants to look at the strengths of LSD, certainly the owls, the acid of, of 1967, which was a flood in America, uh, this was four or five times more powerful than we probably find today. Um, so for the, for the duration of these family collective trips, Charlie watched over his charges, monitoring their individual strength and character, which under LSD were magnified. He would duly note any weakness within the member's psyche, which he would return to at a later date to explore, challenge, or exploit. And by the time the escort worn off, truth and fantasy had seamlessly merged. With Mo Manson's potent suggested now in suggestions now embedded into the subconsciousness. Even those with more resilient wills have been twisted in this direction. Now, we're now looking at the period where the commune really has, has failed. Manson's musical career, of which he proclaimed that he would be as big as, big as the Beatles, had failed. Everything was starting to collapse. And over a period of a few weeks, Murder started to occur, the botched murder of a, um, a, a, a drug dealer, a, a murder of one of the Manson family's friends, arrests in the Manson family circle, and all the lines will come back to Charles Manson. And why I called the book Coming Down Fast is because I believe that the reasons for the horrific murders that happened over that weekend in August 1969 was not for any helter skelter prophecy to start a race war. It was a commune collapsing, and the head of that commune his dreams and his proclamations fallen down, collapsed. Another thing which no one really refers to in, in this story is that many people of the Manson family were now starting to question Manson, saying, when's the revolution coming? Where's your musical career? So in a knee-jerk reaction, and I trace this in the book on an hour-to-hour -hour basis, that Manson had um, gone away to an, uh, 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 what was known as a New Age Institute at that point, a place in Big Circle, Esalen, I don't know if anyone's heard of the Esalen Institute, Manson, in a last-ditch attempt to have his music accepted, went out to Essen. He was laughed out. He came back to Sparn's Ranch at 2 o'clock the following day to find out about the murder of the friend of the family. Two members of the family had just been arrested for credit card uh, use of theft. And it was all coming down fast. At that point, the, some members of the family to cover up the murder, had decided to do a copycat murder to throw police off the track and suggest that it was members of the Black Panthers who committed the murder. And Manson went along with it, and Manson said do it. And that really is the result of that. I don't think the, 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 the press would re refer um, to these Taylor Bianca murders as the first LSD murders. I don't think it had anything to do with it. It was just about a guy whose uh, dominion had collapsed, exploded, had come down fast. And he green-lighted a killing spree. And that really is the sum total. When it went to court, of course, that the establishment, so to speak, were keen to make Manson out as the crazed hippie. Because the hippies were actually, at that point in 1969, probably one of the most powerful forces in California. You've got to remember Timothy Leary was going to stand for governor of um, California which given the support was a, very, was a very real possibility. Mind you, they threw him in jail and so he never had the chance. But I think one has to look contextually at Manson and the whole hippie phenomenon because they, people were seriously rattled by what was going on. And who better to have someone like Charles Manson who fitted the bill of the crazed person? And uh, as I say, I think that um, it's a, an extraordinary story, but it's it, like a lot of the 60s mythology, a lot of it is nonsense or made up. It's mm -hmm. the, uh, the prosecutor against Charles Manson, a guy called Vincent Bugliosi, constructed a uh, prosecution based on Manson's campfire proclamations of the impending race war and Helter Skelter, which, yes, was said, but and, you know, the, the, there was no way that this was going to happen. Uh, it was just nonsense. The reality is a guy gets pissed off because he doesn't have a record contract and everything falls down and green lights a pretty nasty and horrific, there's no doubt about that, killing spree. Um, I looked at the murder statistics in Los Angeles for 1969, which was frankly horrific, but we will refer to this because these are celebrities. 
And as we know, the celebrities, you know, this case afforded 150 detectives, where the average murder in LA is usually signed off by a couple at the most. So it's a fascinating tale. It's, it's, it's separated, for me, the job was to separate the fact from the, um, from the, the fiction, and my God, the, the fiction. Manson now, of course, who is still alive, seems to have become a product of the fiction. So um, he's happy to spew out all, type, all types of craz craziness, because he knows he's never getting out, as his acolytes will never get out. Ultimately, it's a tragic tale, and um, it's a sad tale, and, uh, but it just keeps on rolling. And, um, to say, you know, while a lot of these people are still alive, it was my brief to get this into some sort of shape to allow them to travel into the future. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much for being here.